In this video, we'll be taking a look at algorithm efficiency. There are four algorithms you need to know about for the GCSE. There's two searching algorithms, the binary and linear search, and two sorting algorithms, the merge and bubble sort. We have separate videos in this section that look at each of these in depth. In this video, though, we're focusing on algorithm efficiency. So which version of each of these is more efficient? And what do we even mean by the efficiency of an algorithm? Well, talking about the efficiency of an algorithm is actually quite a complex process. And we look at this in depth in the later half of the video when we go beyond the GCSE specification. But the point of view of your exam, we're simply meaning here which algorithm is typically quicker at performing a task on a data set. So on the screen, we have two algorithms, two functions called sum integers, and they both take in a single parameter n. If you called either of these functions with the value 10, then both of them would perform the calculation 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 10, and they'd return 55. Likewise, if you supplied the integer 100 when you called some integers, it would sum up the numbers 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way through to 100. The point to note here is that both of these algorithms do exactly the same thing. They return the combination of all the numbers added together. So which one is more efficient and how can we tell? If we take the algorithm on the left, we can see there's a line of code here which has to be executed, and that is assigning the value zero to sum. So I've written that out there below. And then you can see we have this line of code to execute, and it says sum becomes equal to the current value of sum plus n. So if we assume n is 10, for example, so that's the value of the parameter that you've passed in, then this line of code would execute 10 times. The first time around the loop, it would perform the calculation 0 plus 1. The second time, 1 plus 2, and then 3 plus 3. So there's 10 additional lines of code that need to be executed, and I've written those out below as well. On the right here, we can see that we have a, again, a single line of code. Sum becomes equal to n times n plus one divided by two. That's not inside an iterative statement like a for loop. That line of code simply runs once and that is it. So even though both algorithms do exactly the same thing, the left-hand version takes far longer to execute. Indeed, if we take this to the extreme and imagine increasing the value of n to a million, then the left-hand version would take significantly longer, whereas the right-hand version would be just as quick no matter what the value of n was entered. Well, that is certainly enough for the GCSE specification to get you to appreciate that although many algorithms can be written to perform the same purpose, it doesn't necessarily mean they are all as efficient as each other. However, if you're finding the topic of algorithms quite interesting, you can put your pen down now and we're going to go over some of the content which will be covered in the A-level and it will make a great introduction to that part of the course. So when we talk about algorithm efficiency, especially beyond GCSE, we can measure efficiency in two ways. We have the time complexity, so that's how much time an algorithm needs to solve a problem. And we have space complexity, so that's amount of resources, e.g. memory, the algorithm requires to complete. Some algorithms are more efficient time-wise than others whereas others are more efficient space-wise than others. If you just go back to the example we looked at in the previous part of the video, we can go a step further now that we're going beyond the GCSE spec. 
Let's ignore that first line of code that's executed because it's only executed once, whereas the blue line is executed 10 times. It's the significant part of this algorithm. Indeed, as the value of n grows, if n was 100 or 1000, the fact that that first red line is executing once really becomes very insignificant. So if we just focus on the blue line, we can see here that this algorithm has what we call a linear time complexity. The, al the algorithm's performance declines in a constant and direct relation as the size of the data set grows. The version of the algorithm on the right has a constant time complexity. The algorithm is always going to execute in the same time, regardless of how big the value of n is. Now these words, constant and linear, are actually something you'll learn about at A-level. You're starting to notice we can now compare algorithms by expressing how complex they are as a function relative to the size of the problem they're trying to solve. And big O notation is a special way for classifying algorithms based on how their computational times grow as their input size grows. On the screen here are a range of big O notations and some descriptions. Again, if we just look back at the example we covered at the start of the video, you can see here the left hand version of our original algorithm has a linear complexity. Whereas the right hand version has a constant complexity. It's a much more efficient version of the algorithm. At A level, you'll also start to study the limits of algorithms, including what we call intractable problems. As computer scientists, we're actually only really interested in algorithms which can solve problems in a reasonable amount of time using a reasonable amount of memory. Tractable problems, therefore, are any problems which are solvable, according to Big O notation, in polynomial time or better. In other words, the algorithm to solve this problem will one run quickly enough to be useful to you. Algorithms which execute exponentially or they are worse in big O notations than polynomial are known as intractable problems. Now it should be noted, this doesn't mean these problems can't be solved by an algorithm. Indeed they can and we have a big O notation for them. It's just that as soon as the input size increases to anything other than a very small data set, it becomes impractical for computers to solve it in any reasonable time frame which would be useful to us. Now, we've definitely gone way beyond the GCSE spec here, so you really don't need to worry, but it's a good insight into how this area of the specification can lead on into A-level, and it's an area which will deepen in your understanding. We know that algorithms are some of the hardest parts of any computer science specification. So we've written a book called Essential Algorithms for A-Level Computer Science, which is available on Amazon. While the title of the book suggests this is only for A-Level, you can see here from the examination board mapping page that we have chapters which cover every algorithm you're required to know for the GCSE. This book then would be perfectly appropriate for you to use and also to take on to A-level should you choose to carry on studying the subject. Every chapter is presented in the same way. We introduce the algorithm from a high-level perspective and provide a link to our videos. We then lay out the algorithm in simple structured English so you can get your head around it. We illustrate the algorithm in the form of a diagram and then provide an example of stepping through it. All of these steps are designed to really get you to understand the algorithm before we present you with pseudocode. After the pseudocode, we present you with actual code written in both Python and Visual Basic, which you could type in and try for yourself.